How many times I've been up here now, but I think I did come probably back in that first few years or so. Mm -hmm. First arrived here, been around. I should look back up my records, but it's been too long and I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the Sarah Observatories kind of correlate uh, with my time here in East Tennessee. Uh, and the picture you're seeing right here is actually of our Sarah Dome out at Kitt Peak. I decided to keep that as sort of a background for all the frames and images up here. Uh, but when you look at the observatories themselves, uh, put together a little history timeline of what was taking place, but it's expanded a lot for those that might know a little bit about Sarah. And to our current status is there are 13 institutions involved and we're up now to three observatories almost worldwide in a sense, certainly a world hemisphere wide uh, that take place. Our latest thing that I actually will kind of emphasize at the end is an observatory in the Canary Islands. So are now we're affiliated with the Instituto de Astrophysica de Canarias, which is actually a European consortium. So really we have almost all of Western Europe as part of SARA now in some ways. So uh, one unfortunate thing about that is we had a, a special meeting out there back in October and I just wasn't able to swing that trip. because I'm really jealous of my colleagues that didn't get to go out there and make that visit. Uh, and we're minus one of our founding institutions, University of Georgia, which we would like to welcome back into the fold. Uh, but observational astronomy just wasn't in one of their main focus and stays right now uh, that they have. But when you think of the history of SARA, it actually began in 1988 almost, and that, that was when the number one 0 0.9 meter, that was the first telescope built on Kitt Peak. Uh, I don't know if anybody, even Tom, had you ever been in the actual building for that telescope? Because you would have had to gone in there before 1990, if that was the case. Uh, so if we weren't out in Kitt Peak before 1990, you missed it because it was, it's currently the site of the WIND telescope. The WIND, uh, if, you, if you've been to the WIND, that promontory was actually an excellent seeing site, an excellent site for uh, stability and so forth. And so that was the site of this original telescope. Well, in 1988, due to budgetary considerations and the fact that a one meter telescope was really quite tiny, uh, even tinier now, but by then quite tiny in terms of world-class standards, they were going to decommission it and actually wanted to make way for the wind telescope as well. So there were four individuals, uh, Terry Oswalt, who's currently at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, was sort of the lead one, uh, our own Harry Powell. I don't know how many people here have met Harry Powell before. He was been retired now for about 12 years from ETSU. Uh, and Harry wasn't even a true astronomer. He was sort of a secondary astronomer. Uh, Ken Rumstay at uh, Valdosta State University in Georgia, and then Scott Shaw, who was at the University of Georgia at that time. Those four had made connections somewhere in the past. And so actually the spring of 1989, they uh, met together and decided they should go and apply for this telescope. Inclinations were that uh, that little group had formed and sort of had the inside track and the running to perhaps get the telescope. They at least had uh, formal commitments from their university presence that they were able to pursue that. And so that was part of the reason I came to ETSU. Uh, I was looking at other universities. ETSU at that time, their total observing facilities, anybody uh, been out to our wooden shed out there? That was no <laughs> neither. Terry had been out there to our little eight foot wooden shed with actually a home built uh, reflector, which is still in our basement uh, back there. And that was the extent of their observing facility, so I wasn't too impressed by that. I was impressed by the fact that maybe we could have our own one meter class telescope at a nice site. Uh, so based on that decision, I joined ETSU in fall of 89, uh, and then in 1990, the telescope was officially awarded uh, to that group. And actually it wasn't until 1991 that the organization was really formalized. So a bit of a step by the university presidents to commit to moving forward with that without even knowing how it would be managed and, and controlled and maintained and so forth. So fairly loose situation of that way. Uh, so it really took about uh, two to three years there from the initial offering to actually get a group together and to get access to the telescope. Turns out paperwork uh, goes much quicker than hardware. <laughs> Uh, maybe software and hardware does sometimes, uh, because while we had the telescope in 1990, it wasn't until 1995 that it saw first light. And we did have some issues along the way, sort of got up with a vendor who wasn't quite up to par to refurbish the telescope. The telescope was in pieces. We had to build our own dome, put it back together, get it in operating condition. Uh, but by 1996, uh, so about five years after uh, we initially got all the pieces together, we had an observatory built. We had the first initial beginnings of remote access over the internet. 
But those who also remember the internet back in those 90 days, uh, wasn't very reliable, wasn't very fast. So I'm not even sure you would call it internet in that time. It was more like uh, you know, a long distance phone call with a lot of noise on it uh, that would break up sometimes. So that's why I say we started in 1996, but basically the majority of the observing and fits and starts was often done on site. We would make trips out with our students during the summer or during breaks during the semesters. So there wasn't a whole lot of use for it during those first few years. There was in intense periods, and most of the summer, good weather, uh, which is really more like May and June in Kitt Peak, it was utilized. So we got some use out of it, but it really wasn't until about 2000 when between the hardware and software and the overall internet itself, we got a little more reliable observations. And I was checking back in our logs thinking that hadn't really sort of summarized this in recent times, but really around 2000, you can see our reports begin to say, uh, wow, we had a pretty successful year. Most people actually got access to it, got it fairly reliably, didn't report too many breakdowns or dropouts and so forth. Though I will say, while we were observing remotely, we did pay to have uh, a Kit Peak staff person available those nights uh, so that if something broke down and we were totally out of control, they could go and put it in a safe mode for us. Uh, and even double check on the weather conditions and so forth. You did have the capability for some monitoring of the weather, but nowhere near like today with all sky cameras and modern uh, monitoring stations. Uh, and so for basically then about uh, 10 years there, roughly 96 uh, to 2007, uh, off and on a bit, uh, that was the Sarah facility. Uh, we had over that time roughly about six members overall. Uh, I said at one point in there, we lost the University of Georgia, but we picked up other members. I forget even now the exact order we picked them up, uh, but as we grew, uh, we realized at some point, well, is this going to be enough? Uh, it's an okay telescope, but it's a very old telescope. It's the oldest of our group right now in that when well, it was decommissioned in 1988, I think that telescope was actually installed on the mountain in like 1959. It's a very good old Bowler and Shibbons design, but it is ancient in terms of modern telescope design in terms of optics. It's a big, massive thing. It's a big heat sink. Uh, lots of issues to deal with it there. So at that point, we had grown. We were using it. Realized, well, is this all we ever want Sarah to be? Uh, and so, uh, not necessarily all members were on board with that, but we realized, well, there is the potential to grow. Uh, and so we began to look around at other opportunities. And one that opened up for us was uh, the Lowell Observatory. Lowell Observatory is in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, but they actually ran a 24-inch telescope at uh, Cerro Tololo. They had run into the same budgetary problems, and it had been mothballed for, uh, I think, probably almost as much as a decade or so, certainly five to ten years. Uh, it wasn't quite as old as our number one. It was smaller. I think it was built down in Cerro Tololo in uh, maybe sort of the mid-70s uh, time frame. Uh, and so we acquired the rights to it. But again, this was an old 24-inch Bowler and Shibbons, so a very good quality telescope, but it was designed to use on-site. And it basically had the same electronics, control functions, and so forth. So it took us two years to get that one going once we had the paperwork signed. Big problem there was as our uh, vendor got down there, our technician realized the dome was in such bad shape it had to be replaced. So we actually had to order and ship and construct an ash dome uh, from was Ash, Indiana, I guess, down to Chile, which took uh, about six months' time to get that done. Plus, uh, basically retrofitting, refurbishing it to be remotely operated. And they got a little bit better. We went from five years down to two years, but it turns out about two to three years is about the minimum time it takes to get such a project uh, going. Uh, and because as soon as that began and we got very successful, uh, we again saw another opportunity to grow. Uh, and these opportunities come about and that when telescopes get decommissioned, you don't have to pay for them. People will just give them to you because they hate to see such valuable equipment just sitting there going to waste. So you basically get sort of an indefinite long-term lease. You just have to maintain them, which is still expensive, but our budget is able to handle that as we grow and get new more members. So most recently here, 213, we actually got the uh, initial agreements uh, going forward to take over uh, the uh, Jacob Capitan Telescope, which is part of the uh, Isaac Newton group of telescopes in the Canary Islands. Uh, and I've got 2015 here because we do have it functional. We do have a camera on it. It has seen first light. We're stuck right now in that the encoding operation to allow the dome to operate remotely isn't quite uh, mechanically sound. 
Hopefully that'll happen by December. So we'll actually hopefully begin using it in December, if not by January. Uh, and in terms of these sites now, well, we'll talk about the details later, but it turns out that our original telescope is probably the worst of the lot in terms of it's just the seeing ability, the oldness of it, sort of the, the time it takes, and the fact I'll show you an image, the Kitt Peak skies are getting really horrible, getting worse and worse all the time. Uh, the Chile site uh, is probably second. It may be almost first, except for the fact it's a 24-inch telescope. So you lose a little bit of light gathering ability, but the seeing is better. And then probably the best of the group is the uh, uh, Canary Islands telescope, calling it RM because that stands for uh, Rose Muchachos. That's the name of the actual volcano there where the observatory is located. Uh, and that one is larger, has about as good a seeing as the... Uh, uh, Chile site, and it's just a dark site up there as well. How large is that one? It's a one meter telescope it's there as well, yeah. Uh, and so why did we get all these telescopes in the first place? Well, SARA stands for the Southeastern Association for Research and Astronomy, so predominantly we want to try to do astronomical research. And part of the extension is, while we're no longer Southeastern, we keep thinking that we're going to have to change our name. Everybody knows how it is in astronomy, right? You figure out something is wrong and mislabeled and misdescribed, but do you ever change the name for it? No. So we're not going to change our name. We're still the Southeastern, although we have institutions in Indiana, in Texas, and now in Europe, basically. Uh, but while well, it stands for research in astronomy, our charter, our consortium agreement, our whole purpose is not just to foster research, but also education, public outreach, everything else. So we can do all these activities. But first and foremost, we want to highlight the research. We think one of the strengths of our consortium is that our astronomers work on basically the entire universe. Uh, we have one astronomer at Valdosta State University that works on asteroids, has actually done some minor spectroscopy of asteroids. Uh, probably even looked at some of these asteroids here. We have one at Florida International that actually looks at quasars and blazars, so the outer rims of the universe in a sense, and just about everything in between. If you throw in a mixture of some theoretical astronomers and modeling types, I've got like 30 here plus, that's observational types. A little bit careful there because formally now we can work with all the astronomers at the IAC, and that's another 35 to 40 astronomers uh, as part of that international group. But if you throw in all the astronomers connected now, theoretical and so forth, we're close to like 100 astronomers associated with our little consortium group. So we've grown over 25 years from four universities and basically four, five, maybe six astronomers uh, to 13, probably soon to be 14, uh, three observatories worldwide and about 100 astronomers. So we think a pretty good success story for what we have there. We started out at Kitt Peak. Uh, there's our uh, 0.9 meter telescope. Uh, this is actually, I think, students that I was out there with one summer. Well, that's not our truck. That's our uh, uh, technician's uh, truck out there. And that's a view looking to the uh, west. And so that is... Uh, Cells down here, and the light pollution is growing worse uh, once uh, the uh, reservations were allowed to put casinos on, make all sorts of money. First thing we do is put up lights everywhere, put up ball fields or lights going all over the place. Uh, the general air pollution quality with the growth, while there are light ordinances, some of that light gets scattered up. There's so much more particulate matter. I will point out that while the sky brightness is decreasing, it's not quite as dirty in a sense as it was in the past. Uh, talking to the astronomers who were there and the telescope uh, technicians uh, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, it was really bad because there were so many ore smelters in the region. They actually had acid pitting going on to the mirror surfaces. So that has stopped. So it's not so much now the mirror surfaces are getting worse from that, but just the total sky brightness. In fact, I noticed even on a moonless night, standing in sort of a hollow up there on top of the mountain, you can still see just a glow all around. You really have to go down the mountain down into the shadow behind from the Tucson and Phoenix glows to really get a dark sky anymore. And I'll show you sort of an image of that to give some indication of that up here. So here's the views of what we have. The instrumentation base has changed, but I'll show you a little bit more about what we have on there now. Uh, but that is the, uh, what used to be known as the 36 inch. It's officially though the 0.9 meter. Uh, here are some students I had out here, and there's actually Rachel Horn. She's teaching with Tom in her labs now, one of our former students here. Uh, and some views uh, more recently. This is more like what the current instrument package is. So instead of this little box, uh, there's a big metal uh, 
gold canister on there, which is the doer for our coolest CCD. And an image of our control room. We do have a control room if we do want to go out on site and control things with various computers. We basically have a computer to control the telescope instrumentation on it. We have another computer to control the scientific instrumentation. Third computer, which controls the uh, weather station and uh, webcams and so forth, video cameras. You could sort of do all that with one, but they get tasked quite a bit to do that. So let me have one or two backup computers around. So it's big and impressive. When you go out there, it's kind of impressive. But if you've ever been to any major observatory site or been paying attention to the 10 meter class, the 15 meter class, uh, the 30 meter telescope to begin with, the VLTs, it's really kind of small. Uh, in fact, I. Uh, helped co-author an article about 10 years ago now, it seems, about uh, the idea that even a four-meter class telescope is becoming considered a small telescope on the world scale. So what's happening to Kitt Peak, unfortunately, is uh, we don't think it will be moved, but probably within the next decade or so, Kitt Peak will no longer be being considered a world-class sort of observing facility because the largest telescope is the four-meter, and it just pales in comparison to anything else on top of which the sky condition is deteriorating somewhat up there. So they're not going to mothball it or take everything down, but it'll be somewhat privatized and you'll see uh, government and university uh, organizations going towards places again like Chile and Hawaii and these remote sites where you get big 10 meter class telescopes up there. So this is kind of what the sky looks like now. Uh, and you've been there and not know how impressive it might appear. Somebody had just a little light, like camera light on in here. There's the uh, wind behind us over there. Uh, and if you can see, you can see the Milky Way. It's kind of clear that you can see some star density, but I'll show you an example from Chile in a little bit, which is just chock full of stars. They're about the same conditions. Uh, we have, again, the light pollution, particulate pollution from Southern California heads our way. Uh, and then while used to, you couldn't see the glow from Phoenix too bad, you can clearly see it now as the Phoenix suburbs have grown out. Uh, and Tucson does have a light ordinance, but you can look now where used to Tucson was covered low by the Tucson Hills. The west side of that is starting to grow. Uh, so the reservation is starting to grow in size. Uh, and so it's really just becoming a, a much more polluted site than it used to be. So it's okay to go out there. But I tell people you don't really expect to go out there and see fantastic dark skies anymore. You even find places here in East Tennessee, if it's dry, uh, that are darker than you can from the top of Kitt Peak. Uh, and some details about the observatory, just because we had a ready-made slide here. Uh, it's about 2,000 meters in elevation. Its official aperture is 0 .19, or 914 meters, uh, about a 7-meter focal length, so effective F ratio about 7.5. There is the capability to switch out the secondary and give a higher F ratio, but again, the main purpose is imaging, so we want wide field aspects, uh, so we keep it that way. Gives us about a 48 arc minute field diameter. Be great if we had a high quality CCD chip that was that big. <laughs> um, but one that big would cost a fortune now, which we can't put into our budget. Uh, so uh, the chip we have right now images about 12 arc minutes on the side. Still very nice. Here's the real problem that we have is our typical best seeing is about two arc seconds. Uh, and I know our local observatory is really poor. Any amateurs here estimate your best thing you've seen around here in East Tennessee? Your small scopes ever tried to do anything or done some imaging, but uh, we have problems in that uh, it's not the dome. The dome is all aluminum. It's an ash dome. It's on a reasonably good site. Our main problem is thermal, is that that telescope, as you saw, is a closed tube, and it's uh, steel, so it's a big thermal mass. Generally, our best seeing is not, and if you open it up an hour before sunset with the dome facing away and a little bit of a breeze, it's still after midnight before the stupid thing cools down really well. Plus, I mentioned the optics. The mirror is one of these still thick plate glass mirrors. So you've got like about uh, four to six inches of glass and all that steel has to cool down. We keep toying with refrigerating it, putting an air conditioning unit in there, but the electricity cost and the expense just doesn't quite seem uh, worth it. So it's kind of more of a big light bucket, but it gets decent enough images uh, at times of year. But we do occasionally get some winds. The site that we chose is a site, unfortunately, uh, there were limited sites to build on Kitt Peak. We're sort of in between two promontories, so the wind kind of funnels up that and blows over. So on a windy night, it can be bad as well. But if you face away from the wind, it's not quite so horrible. Uh, and I mentioned just the details of the chip right here. The fact that we have multiple filters, both narrow-brand and broadband filters, and the capability to put more in. We actually have a 
a dual, uh, in this case it's yeah, dual 24 position filter wheel, so we can sample a lot of different things. Uh, the chip is right now an applied uh, astronomical research camera's camera, which we like very much because it's in a doer, it's cooled to minus 110 Celsius, so there's no dark current, there's no noise, thermal noise of any type within. Uh, we're having troubles though with the system, and it's a closed cycle system. We've got to pump it down, we've got to refrigerate it. So we might end up going, even though it costs a lot, we've been using it for several years, might end up going to a, a almost as expensive, not quite as much, but a triple stage thermoelectric system that will cool to minus 50 or minus 60 and does just about as good, maybe more reliable in the long run. Not to run tubes up there and check on it every few months in that case. Uh, so we have lots of options there for imaging things. Tom has used this telescope, uh, and uh, he's done basically uh, the infrared blocking for these latest studies of the transit objects, but even done some globular clusters with the filters and so forth. Uh, so we can do quite a bit. Even though our seeing isn't the best, uh, Kit Peak does have reasonably dark skies in that uh, this is one ADU per minute. That's his scale that means you just get one photon count basically over a minute. You can go down to 27th magnitude. But you're not going to measure anything at that. Realistically, in looking at what we've uh, done, we have some colleagues that are trying to catch gamma ray burst objects, uh, and one right now that's trying to catch a recurrent nova in the Andromeda galaxy. I was going to observe that Tuesday, but it was cloudy here and it was raining in Kitt Peak, so uh, not much chance out there. Uh, but it seems like we can realistically get down to about 19th uh, magnitude uh, with reasonable integration times to make useful measurements. That's sort of our, our limit there. Maybe 20th under really ideal conditions. Uh, but the actual seeing for the bigger telescopes is still a bit darker sky than that out there. And uh, it's kind of neat. Uh, the same grant that got us the spectrograph, but it took a little bit while longer because it was sort of the first one uh, the company had actually built. We have a fiber-fed shell spectrograph. Uh, it's fiber-fed because uh, the spectrograph itself is so large. While you might be able to mount it on the telescope, you've got to worry about flexure problems and everything else, so it's much easier to take a front end, which is the fiber and calibration lamps. You mount that to the back of the telescope that's light, feed the fiber down to our control room, which is temperature controlled, and run that into this bigger bench-mounted spectrograph. It's not a huge thing. It's maybe about uh, oh, a third the size of this table. Uh, and I'll show you an image of sort of the inside guts in a little bit. But the idea behind it being a shell is that you get a cross dispersion. So in one image of your CCD, this is what it looks like. Uh, now this is a little bit artificial in that this is not a star. That's the sun. <laughs> and what we did, we just took the bare fiber, pointed at the sun, put a nice color camera on the end. This was the vendor just showing us what it could do. Uh, but it is kind of cool that you have all this. Of course, the problem in astronomy, and even with some of our colleagues, is do you really want an entire spectrum? Well, in the ideal world, maybe you do, but you're not going to study and analyze everything. For stars, you have things like hydrogen alpha, uh, which over here tends to actually be over in this part of the spectrum here in emission. Uh, you might have a few lines in sodium and so forth, but often you could uh, sort of peak this up so just a certain part of the spectrum is highlighted and has the highest resolution. But again, our goal was we've got 30-some astronomers who might use this for a variety of projects. The main issue we have is being fiber-fed is that means there's a lot of light loss as it comes through the fiber, not directly at the telescope's focal point. Uh, and it's only a one meter class telescope. So you know, when you take a spectrum, we've taken that light from a bright star and spread it out over the entire CCD chip. So what it means is we're limited effectively to objects no fainter than about ninth magnitude to observe. Still a lot of interesting objects out there, uh, but it means we're all going to be doing things that aren't typical when you talk about spectroscopy of like faint galaxies or nebular things of this nature that go out there. And it does have a resolution here. This R factor of 19 is sort of a measure of the resolution. Basically what that means is we can measure uh, changes that might correspond to say to a velocity movement of a star or a shift in a line that could correspond to uh, a few uh, uh, kilometers uh, per second. So this is comparable to like winds in a stellar atmosphere. So it has use to us uh, and we're getting data with it, we're analyzing it, but we're right now we're trying to get a grant so it can fund our analysis efforts uh, to go along with it. Uh, and of course the actual spectrum isn't going to be color. <laughs> 
because this is still a you know monochrome CCD that's taking the images. As I said, this was just a fun one of the sun, so we could see what it would look like in that case. So here's what the instruments right now we have look like. Here is the CCD camera. Uh, this part right here mounts to the back of the telescope. The gold part is the doer, so it's a pump down about every three or four months uh, to hold the vacuum. Uh, and then we don't use liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. That'd be a really pain to have to deal with. It's a uh, uh, $25,000 closed cycle refrigeration system. Not sure what coolant it uses, uh, but it's closed cycle, so we don't have to worry about it as long as the pumps and everything stay working. Uh, this is an interface here that goes down more at the computer with a few cards in place. Uh, but that system with the pump is about a $75,000 CCD system. Uh, but mostly what we're paying for extra there is the doer and the refrigeration. The other camera I'm talking about, which we have at uh, Canary Islands, uh, is about a $55,000 camera. So uh, high-end research of this are in that $50,000 range. Uh, down here is part of the internal workings of the spectrograph. The most important part is this grating right here. Uh, it's a cross-dispersed uh, uh, spectrum, but we have the grating. Uh, and then back here, some lens elements. What's not shown here is back behind all this would be the camera. It's a fairly compact design. It's maximized, again, to give us that full spectrum that matches the CCD we have in place. And that CCD itself needs to be cooled to about minus 50 Celsius, although it does use a little external uh, pump system. But being smaller and in the climate-controlled warm room, it works a little bit easier. Uh, here's one of our uh, vendor presents. The uh, vendor is a company called ACE. Astronomical Consultants and Equipment, they're based in Tucson. He's working here on our filter wheels and uh, finder system. What's not shown here yet is the actual uh, front end piece of the spectrograph that goes on. And here's another example of sort of the instrument table and plane that goes on the back end. We do have one more port available to stick an instrument out there uh, because people always want to go up and stick an eyepiece in to look through the telescope. You know, astronomers never ever do that anymore. But there is one port available. We have some eyepieces, so if somebody comes out and I'm visiting and say, i got to adjust the focus and move mirrors and everything, but I can go back and stick one in. You can look at something through the, the telescope up there. Uh, but even its ultimate right here, uh, I know Dan was telling me he has an Apogee camera. This was our older Apogee camera that we had stuck on there at that point. Uh, and you can do quite uh, excellent research with those great cameras now, both SBIG and QSI, Apogee, Finger Lakes. All excellent cameras for a few thousand dollars that can do the same type of work. The issues are in terms of the chip quality and the cooling capabilities is what we look for. And here's an example of some images. Uh, I think these were actually taken with this ARC camera now. And I actually may have helped take this one here of the Ring Nebula. Uh, again, these were taken through multiple filters. We don't have the standard RGB type, but we can sort of manipulate that with uh, Maxim DL or something to make the colors. Uh, and this uh, uh, might be M82 here, showing actually the H2 regions and the young star formation going on out there. You can see some saturation in those stars that show up there. Uh, so they're not uh, bad images. They're pretty good. But most of these images, we didn't really spend a lot of effort or time to take. Those of you who know Adam Block, who was at Kitt Peak, I think he might be with Arizona at Catalina Mountains. He was using a little 16-inch, but he just has spent so much time. He makes the most gorgeous pictures. I mean... I think Adam Block probably has 10% of all the APOD pictures out there when he was taken at Kitt Peak. Uh, but we know we can image quite nicely, get some detail out there uh, at Kitt Peak. Uh, but like I said, here's our little Cerro Tololo uh, telescope, and we can actually image better with it just because the seeing is so much better that the improved seeing allows us to get more uh, better focus and actually better than a contrast or exposure just about in the Kitt Peak Telescope for the similar objects. But this is at Cerro Tololo, out from La Serena, sort of about two-thirds up the coast of Chile. Uh, close, but not that close to the latest uh, earthquake uh, back in September, the 8.4 magnitude was fortunately far enough away. We didn't notice any damage aspects, although I did see reports that Gemini and SOAR did have some alignment issues they had to get fixed. They were down for a couple of days. Uh, just like Kitt Peak, you can see it's a very bare desert region. One issue we have here is if the wind blows from this direction, it can pick up some of the dirt and soils and bring it up our way. Plus, sometimes the fog rises up here because we're not at the very top. This is actually kind of isolated and off to the side from the major observatory site up there. Uh, and it, again, is uh, Bowling Shivers 24-inch, so 0.6 meters. 
about the same elevation again, a little over 2,000 meters. Sort of an optimum elevation. If you get up too high, you know the air starts to get too thin. Astronomers got to breathe too. Remotely, don't mean that much. If you get too low, you start worrying about fog and humidity conditions. I'll show you a really neat picture here, but of course, you don't want to put in the foothills. Top of the Andes stay clouded quite a bit, it turns out. Uh, again, have uh, now, this is the same thing, uh, the little bit smaller uh, field of view, uh, but basically what we have is uh, right now identical imaging system with the CCD camera, an identical imaging system with the spectrograph. They've been tweaked to align to the uh, F ratios, uh, and the spectrograph isn't quite totally functioning yet, and the camera just had a cooler failure. So it's kind of uh, in limbo right now. But the idea was to have similar systems. So if we had objects in the northern and southern hemisphere, and particularly overlapping in the equatorial range, we might could observe them uh, from both telescopes simultaneously or extend the observing season based on the uh, weather and conditions that take place. Uh, and Chile tends to have much better weather statistics. They only have maybe about a, a couple of months with some uh, winter patterns there in uh, May, uh, April and May for them whereas Kitt Peak tends to have the bad monsoons and some winter storms come through. Uh, big thing there is the typical seeing at our sites about one to maybe one and a half arc seconds. Uh, Saratoga itself will report seeing typically of about 0.7 arc seconds. And I've gotten some images down below one arc second there, but the best I've ever done at Kitt Peak is maybe one and a half arc seconds on an ideal night. So when you get seeing twice as good, that means your storm image is that much tighter and smaller and you can expose uh, that much deeper. Uh, and we can expose all those things neatly in the southern hemisphere down there. So here's a telescope, classic old 24-inch Bowler and Shivens. This does not, again, have our current instrumentation on there, but if you looked at the back end of this versus our Kit Peak telescope, they would look quite uh, similar. Uh, again, the fiber-fed spectrograph. The problem we're dealing with that we're looking at trying to change is, unlike Sarah North, where there's a warm room to keep the important equipment in an office-like environment, there's no warm room here. It's just that uh, concrete shell building that you saw. So we are looking at getting maybe some large climate-controlled cabinets to put the more sensitive instrument in. We were having some computer issues. We may have solved those, uh, but things even like the spectrograph needs to be in a nice sort of uh, warm temperature controlled box. Uh, here's a view looking down on top. So there's the main flattened top peak with the big telescopes over there. Uh, here's some dormitory residents. Here's some uh, physical plants. And here's where our Sarah Observatory is, stuck out here sort of in the middle of nowhere. So I think they got the land cheap, the servicing cheap. Uh, and they would go down basically uh, during summers, because remember, it's southern and the northern hemisphere, you're not doing observing here. You go down summer, you got you know, 14 hours of darkness in Chile to observe. So that was the low plan for the most of the time. So it wasn't even typically used year round when they had it. Here's the view from the mountain. There's the Andes crest. And they always seem to have snow. Again, no matter where they are there. And often you'll see clouds, especially with those guys, which is often right at the peak of the mountain. So here on the leeward side, it's very dry, very stable winds. And said so generally really good weather statistics uh, down there. Uh, and here's a view down there, not even totally dark yet. This glow here is from twilight still, but look at the star counts in here. I was trying to figure out, but I can't identify what's what because it's in the southern hemisphere. I've never been down there, so it's backwards and upside down. But this right here should be the you know, central region of Sagittarius and Scorpio looking at the center of the Milky Way uh, right in there. I'm sure the field is there somewhere. I even have trouble looking at the Isle Sky camera trying to figure out you know, Orion's upside down, everything that's going on up there. Uh, but uh, just so much, such a darker sky. In absolute darkness, there is a little bitty town called Vicuna which is about maybe 20 miles down the mountain. You can see just a hint of a little glow over there, and that's like about it up there. So it really is a nice uh, dark sky side up there. Uh, so they've done some excellent imaging down there. And here's an example. I think everybody can recognize this, uh, Centaurus A. Uh, and, uh, and again, this isn't really trying to do the very best absolute job, but just great detail and so forth. Again, this is glomeration of some images to make the color there. I forget if uh, Bill Kill from Alabama might have taken that one since he's a galaxy guy. Uh, but there's excellent sites to uh, take images from. And then finally, our third and newest here, and this is the group I was supposed to be with but wasn't uh, part of. Can't quite see his face, but there's Terry Oswald. I wanted to point him out as one of the again, founding members. He's been really the driving force behind Sarah from all along. He was at Florida uh, Technical uh, <coughs> 
uh, Florida Institute of Technology down in Melbourne, Florida. He's moved up to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, uh, where he's the department chair up there now. But there's a view of the JKT in the background, the Jacobus Captain Telescope. Uh, and you can see it's on the edge of a volcano. We're just now in the debates about insurance. Should we get insurance? Well, when you get insurance these days, you get fire, flood, and uh, water, right? Uh, excuse me, you get fire, flood, and earthquake. I'm thinking, why do we need all that? Well, Kitt Peak, uh, even just about two years ago, another fire that actually came up to the base of the mountain. So there's fire danger out there. It's not going to flood in any of these sites, but Chile just had a major earthquake. We're on the site of a volcano here, actually on the caldera. In fact, if you come over farther where they are right here, it's not that many feet, and you can stare down. I think I've got an image that shows it deep down into the caldera there. And while it's a dormant ancient volcano, the Canary Islands still have active regions, so there's danger there. But we're thinking, too, these have been in these places for decades, never a single loss. So we probably won't take the insurance. It's awful expensive to get that kind of coverage. Uh, but, but then tomorrow, yeah, you know, so. Well, the, the other thing, so we're debating this, right? It's kind of discussion you go around and keep thinking, well, you know, it's like, it costs us like 10% of our budget just for insurance, right? When we need equipment and so forth. And then we're thinking, okay, what's the worst case scenario? You're not going to have an earthquake at all these sites. Say you lose one, we still got two, right? <laughs> and right now, we've kind of got enough time to worry about. So we're thinking, uh, if nobody tells us you have to do it. We'll just fly by the seat of our pants for a while. Uh, <laughs> But here now, you can see we're out here now at a negative 17 longitude. So we're almost hoping to go to Australia because then we might actually cover 360 year round. We may still look at growing to a fourth in Australia at some point in the future. Uh, but we're almost at about the same latitude as Kitt Peak. Kitt Peak's about 32, we're at 28, so we're not really gaining anything there, but we are a little bit more in hemisphere. The real push everybody wanted on this telescope is they were tired of having to work all day and observe all night because this will be dark when we're in the daytime. So I can teach a class, go back to my office and be observing from my office, don't have to stay up all night. Kitt Peak is a couple hours behind, Chile's about an hour ahead, so Chile's really the worst. With Kitt Peak, you can go home, get dinner, relax a little bit, then start observing. Chile, as soon as it's five o'clock here, it's dark down there. You can go home immediately and start observing. With this, you could start at like noon or something, do it most of the evening time. Uh, Better design. Again, we're talking about overall quality better. This is a newer telescope, different optical design, open truss tube, so much better uh, seeing conditions, thermal conditions, and so forth. It's newer. Uh, didn't require quite as much to be retrofitted uh, because of the newer aspects. It also has a big building you can see with infrastructure uh, in place. Uh, not again that we would go there regularly. Uh, it's not so much the expense as the time. Part of the reason I couldn't quite fit the trip in is you can't fly there in a day. You've got to fly to Madrid, catch another flight to Tenerife, and then another flight to La Palma Island. So uh, it really takes about a day and a half to get there. Uh, and uh, it's not really that expensive, as I said, once you're there. Certainly a, a gorgeous location, but more than likely we'll continue to use this site remotely as we go up there. But I would at some point while I'm working with Sarah actually go to all three sites. Uh, Here's a view inside. Again, we don't have everything quite put on, but here, all we have right now is that silver box, and that is the Andor camera. Okay, I've got to mention about it a little bit later here. Uh, Andor is a company out of England. Uh, very nice cameras. Uh, the main advantage for them is it's all self-contained. It's thermoelectric. We'll get down to minus 50, minus 60, uh, and uh, works quite reliably. Uh, and they seem to be able to supply them a little bit more timely than, than some other vendors when you want a high uh, research grade in here. Actually, I got it up here, don't I? Yeah. Uh, it's again, uh, with that field of view, 2048, 2048 is again not giant megapixel chips. We don't need megapixels. One problem is if you make them too big, the download times take too long. And we need to be able to do some time series stuff, fairly frequent observations. Uh, so with that size, basically about the same chip around other cameras, we'll still be seeing about a 12 arc minute field of view. Uh, which isn't huge, but it's plenty to encompass a cluster, a galaxy, the sorts of things we need to be in place. Uh, and so we hope to be doing that there. Is there a better picture of Terry here? I don't see him in this view right here. Uh, you see this is a more traditional formal type observatory. The glass window here opens up onto the control room. Astronomers on site would have been inside looking at the glass window at the telescope itself. Uh, Looks more massive, again, a little bit more massive structure than the Boulder and Shivens, so this one actually could probably support, even though it's the same one meter class size, support more inst instrumentation hanging off the back end if we went that far. 
Ultimately, we might want to get a spectrograph there as well, but as it was, the cost to retrofit, get the camera, uh, being it was overseas, the travel involved, all these sorts of things, it's about a $450,000 project to take it. So even though we got it for free, still nearly half a million to put it in working order. Fortunately, we did get a big grant to cover that for us. Uh, and so here's the sites looking around here. Oh, there's Terry Oswald again right there. I'm trying to think who in that group is. Uh, these two are people from the IAC. Not sure what their names are. Uh, and there's a nice site of the building itself uh, set up there. And looking down, this is looking down towards the ocean. And back on this side, you look down into the volcanic caldera. Here we have our weather station and all sky camera again. Uh, with Kitt Peak, we have some backups, even Cerro Tololo, because the major observatory sites have their own uh, instrumentation. I'm sure they must have that at, uh, here as well. Uh, but I haven't checked onto that because we're not quite into the observing mode, but we do have the capability to check conditions ourselves. And here, again, darker sky sites, generally you know, just as good as seeing as Cerro Tololo. The seasonal thing here is you often get dust from the Sahara Desert that blows over certain times of year, and the dust gets too much that shuts down observing. But other than that, uh, not too much of a pattern. This is, a, this is farther north, so we're not where the hurricanes develop. We're not down where the, the Cape Verde Islands are. So it really is a pretty nice location. Uh, look here, looking down into the tube and the mirror assembly and so forth, it sets up there. So everyone kind of wants to jump on using that guy because it will ultimately be the best uh, conditioned telescope. And with the time factor involved, uh, they want to jump in and start using it. Now here's a view. So here's a view looking down into the uh, caldera of the volcano that is from the edge. Notice, not Maybe not exactly our edge, but near where the observatory site is. Here's the headquarters for the IAC in Tenerife down there, and then some pictures of bigger domes. So I'm not familiar with all of them, but here's a nice wide scan view of the observatory site up there looking down. Uh, always notice how when you see these sites, uh, what you want is perfectly blue, clear skies, nothing to block it, but it makes for boring photos. So you always see observatory photos with like lightning or with clouds or dusty sunsets because it looks so pretty, but that's the rare conditions that are up there really should be more ideal uh, that we have up there. Uh, so we're anxious to get that one going as well. Uh, we will be sharing time with the IAC astronomers as well as the SARA group. Uh, and here's some images here. Here's the Hale Bop. Uh, and this is actually the JKR, our SARA RM, we're calling it now, telescope Hale Bop in the background. You get a little indication of the darkness of the skies there. Uh, and then here is uh, M92. Uh, taken with that particular telescope. Okay. Not our camera, because again, we haven't quite gotten the, the full details, but this shows the capabilities, and that's a pretty sharp, detailed imager. Right, so uh, we're quite certain, given this is a newer telescope, really designed for imaging from the get go. Uh, both the Bowen and Shivens telescopes were really more designed as photometry light buckets, they really weren't designed for imaging. So I can put secondaries in. Configuration really is an optimum. So this is by far going to be our, our most optimum facility, but the uh, IC people are guaranteed 10% of that time. And among the 30 astronomers fighting for time over the year, we won't be getting quite as much time, but spread out over three telescopes, I've got more observing time than I can deal with. So we're not worried about that aspect. When we have the need for things that will be available to us. Uh, and so here's one aspect of that I had to throw in. Again, our old-fashioned Sarah logo, but looks kind of cool. Uh, the moon, uh, circle here. Uh, flamingo in there. Why the flamingo? Because, again, sort of the founding institution was Florida Institute of Technology. And though flamingos aren't native to Florida, or Miami, everybody thinks of, you know, pink flamingos in Florida. Uh, we've got them over there in Jonesboro, right out past at the farm, going by our show people. We've got pink flamingos here. So we kind of kept that. And if you go out to our Sarah Observatory, I didn't see it in the photo, but... We keep on uh, stash a few in case the weather gets so many. Have to have a little pink flamingo seaming it into the ground there in front of the door. Tom's been out there. I think he's, he's seen the flamingo out there. Don't know about putting them at the other observatories, how well that would go, but uh, sometimes they might do that. Uh, but now we have our uh, uh, service site here uh, and then Chile down here. And so they actually do just fit on a hemisphere right here. So the only bad thing is that means we can't observe something 360 year round. Uh, but it's sort of a pretty nice fitter that they fit on that way. And although we forgot, uh, I don't know why I've forgotten here, to put over here a little circle for the IC. These circles indicate the home institutions as we look back over there. Uh, so we do have uh, Valparaiso and Ball State and uh, 
Butler University, uh, which is in Indianapolis, so three in Indiana. Uh, we've got uh, now three in Florida. So we've got Florida Institute of Technology, uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical, which is up at uh, Daytona Beach, and then Florida International, again in Miami. Uh, way over here to the left, this is uh, Texas A&M in Commerce. One of our colleagues that was in Florida became a chairman there and said, you know, hey, I've, got, I've got some pool, I've got some contacts here, and we could use the money. So they bought in, uh, and that's working out quite well for us. Uh, and then here in the middle, we still have ETSU and uh, Clemson, Agnes Scott, and University of Alabama. So, they there. so we actually have a mixture, uh, which we think is also healthy for us. We've got a mixture of big name state universities, uh, private technical universities, and general public universities. Uh, that kind of fits. So we can all kind of give our own um, mix and take to it. Uh, and it's worked pretty successful so far, and maybe in the future. And so our last slide is sort of our uh, uh, poster slide now that we have to take around to us so we can list all the institutions. Uh, Embry-Riddle is highlighted here just because uh, Terry Oswald put this slide together. So, <laughs> so we give him credit for talking to his administrators about that. Uh, but we have the nice picture now of our Kitt Peak facility, the Cerro Tololo, uh, and the latest version over here. I like the way he's done this. So we need to do some more work, which uh, uh, I'm actually going to try to do or get some help with. And that now that we have all three in place, uh, and we on the science side from ETSU would like to point out there's more than football new happening at ETSU is. <laughs> Uh, once we get that first slide in the spring, we're going to try to push to get a nice big PR article released to the university. We've already got the verbiage for it but with some nice graphics and so forth. So maybe we can get TV and newspaper and the university uh, webpage uh, involved. I know Wayne has come to our talks. We had a visiting astronomer from uh, Iowa State come and give some neat talks about the uh, end of the Earth and the sun uh, later on. And so I want to push the fact that among the other things ETSU is doing, they're part of a world-class uh, consortium of astronomy research with these facilities. Uh, plus, I got to ask them for more money. We got to up our dues to help pay for all this. Uh, and they're, they're not inclined to always uh, pay more money for things that are kind of quiet in this way and not visible on campus. Uh, but that's facilities that we have. And uh, certainly I know in Tom's case, he's used them. I'd like to mention if anybody has a worthwhile project or something or wants to make some access, we do have time. I usually find I can't always use it if it's something I could accommodate. And if you have maybe an educational need or a little research project you want to try, uh, we do have that percentage of time we like to devote to that. It helps us with our release and so forth. And you can certainly talk to Tom about what he's done with his high school students. But you know, if you're thinking of trying a certain photometry project or so forth, uh, even occasionally we'll just take a pretty picture because someone says, no, I can take a, I like to make a really pretty picture of this. It's something we can use for our PR releases. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially if I've got like a 12-hour night and I can only use really a few hours of it, uh, we're not quite as sophisticated yet to make really efficient use of every minute of time catching photons. We hope to gravitate towards that. But with three observatories around the world and a multitude of instruments and astronomy mm -hmm. research projects, it's a big thing to coordinate and make happen together. Uh, so we're fairly successful at doing that, but we could do better. And I certainly do have, I uh, won't say time to waste, uh, but time that uh, can be freed up and time that's available to do a variety of things. And so I'm happy to, to help out the community here as well as you go through that. So that being the last slide, I'll stop there and take questions or comments. So right how the is the observing time divvied up? Uh, basically right now what I'm trying to do is give an equal share to everyone. Everyone's kind of, there's one exception, Valdosta here for the years. Valdosta's never been able to bring their full dues up to, to norm. They started out a little bit earlier, I don't know why. It's easy to start these things in the beginning, but they were a little bit smaller. So they get a slightly less proportion. Basically we just take what is the typical number of uh, free observing nights based on the statistics and what we have there. And we just, you know, fortunately get so many, a dozen or so per uh, semester per telescope. It's about what we get right now. So I think that's like 24 not nights every six months, which is a lot of nights to, to spend up all night. Now you lose some for weather. We used to do some for hardware, but it's become much more reliable. So that's very limited now. Occasionally a computer crashes or something like that. Uh, but then the real difficulty, and Bill Kill at Alabama, bless his heart, he's been willing to do it for us, is we tell him what types of nights we need or what time frames we need or about what schedule, and then he builds that into the calendar for us and tries to, you know, 
try to settle arguments among ourselves if things come up. Certain people have uh, time critical observations, uh, an eclipse of a star or something of that nature, so it'll get first priority. Other ones might want a solid block of time because they're involved with a campaign to just hit this target hard for a while, so we'll give them that time. Everyone else like me is just like, well, I'm not doing anything time intensive. Yes, we teach, but it comes and goes. So I say, no, just give me no more than about one night a week. I try it at once, and I tell them, that's a nice idea to think, well, I could be observing in three telescopes at once. I said, no, I can't, can't survive if I do that with computers and everything else. Just too much to keep straight in your mind. It gets to be like three in the morning, and you forget which telescope you're on. You've got, you know, maybe two computers and three screens. And I've done this too many times. I'll hit the wrong button to close something out or do something I didn't mean to do. So, no, just one telescope a night. It's better over that time. Uh, our big hope now is, well, what if you did get three telescopes on one night? What would probably happen is, and, and though the odds would be slim, you could get bad weather in all three telescopes in one night, even on the whole hemisphere. Because uh, it is now, I have had occasions or seen astronomers who have gotten both Arizona and Chile and been, you know, clouded out or something on the same night. You think, couldn't you get a break and have one of those being clear in some sense? But uh, having enough time is really the least of anybody's problems right now because uh, quite often people will give up a night saying, look, I just, you know, Got what I need right now. I've got a big thing tomorrow morning, so I'm going to take this night. Uh, you can have at it. A few of the groups that have uh, armies of graduate students or colleagues who can kind of jump in, they can sort of take over those things. So, uh, and a few groups, unfortunately, probably some nights go to waste because they really don't make use of it when they could make these announcements uh, and do it. Uh, and so we've been kind of happy that, you know, with this wide group of individuals, we've been, you know, pretty. Uh, Amy, amicable group and working together pretty good and looking for solid things. Uh, our concern right now is more towards the future and that as universities come in, uh, our typical cost has been about $75,000 to join, but then only about $10,000 a year dues. And that $10,000 is too much of a problem. And if they can come up with that $75,000, that helps us out a lot. Uh, although costs are going up. And right now, between the expense to maintain something overseas, uh, down in Chile, which while the local costs are okay, the expenses of sending technicians down, equipment back and forth and all uh, gets to be a trouble. And even though Kitt Peak is closer, it, it won't say it breaks down a lot, but it needs a little more constant maintenance aspects. That, uh, and plus, you eventually got to replace computers, small things break and so forth. So we're looking at our yearly budget uh, approaching about $200,000. And so with our membership right now, a little bit of reserve, that's about what we've got. So we have a little padding going on for another uh, you know, five, four or five years or so. That's why we're looking to get another member. Each time we get a new member, their buy-in gives us our reserve. Uh, because like I say right now, we're faced with either potentially $25,000 to replace the whole cooling system. It's only about three years old, but you know, of course everything is out of warranty and what do you do? You replace that. It's a good system, but might it go down again? Or looking towards buying the uh, and or camera. And the other aspect is, well, we try to have spares, especially these remote sites. If you want to maintain full spares of uh, instruments and computers, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars of equipment. You kind of would like to have, but it's sitting over in a closet. <laughs> but if what you've got in the telescope goes bad and you're in Chile, it may take, you know, if it's a big piece of equipment, you can't just overnight that to Chile. It doesn't happen that way. You've got to deal with uh, uh, customs and so forth and these issues. Uh, and so we can be down for potentially two or three weeks at a time. And if people have crucial projects, that's a long time to be down, especially if everything else is fine and it's just, well, our one camera is bad. It'd be nice to have a spare quality camera down there. But again, that's tens of thousands of dollars, which isn't that much padding in our budget to handle. So but we are pretty healthy right now. Uh, I said, we've got the, this one is down for the moment. The other problem we've been faced with is, while they do good work, our current vendor is, I mentioned Ace in Tucson. It's really Peter Mack, and he's kind of it. We all keep thinking, he's going to drop dead of a heart attack, then what are we going to do? Because it's his systems, he's designed them. He does have some minimal staff. Basically, his wife does the books, his daughter runs the office, his son-in-law is one of his technicians, he's got a couple of the guys on hand. But it is one of these very small oper operations, and he travels the world all the time. He was in the Canary Islands for three weeks. Now he's in Australia. He's got to go back to England. He needs to get down to Chile and finish our spectrograph details. Uh, but uh, he's somewhat spread thin. Uh, 
but the systems he builds are quite good and reliable, and there's not too much in the way of competition uh, for the cost. I mean, he's not real cheap, but other big ends are just way expensive to try to do these things. Uh, but we're hoping to get him robust, reliable enough in aspects that and he's got enough people that know what's going on that if we do have major issues, uh, they can be redone. Uh, uh, so we're in pretty good shape right now. We've got this growth. We've got things that are functioning. Uh, and we should have this telescope back up before the end of the year with Jay Takey coming on. So our hope is like in January, we can announce here we are, Sarah, you know, operating three research class observatories. Uh, they're not big in aperture by any means, but they're an ideal site with state-of-the-art instrumentation, remotely operated, uh, and with such a huge group of astronomers doing so many research programs that we feel that our consortium now is the equivalent almost like of a, a minor, you know, uh, sort of national research facility uh, to carry out astronomy research is all that we do. Other questions? We're looking right now, starting to look for at least one more member, perhaps two, and the focus there is with two more members, it gives us a little more financial stability, doesn't really hurt our observing time allotments. Do you have anybody uh, in mind, any, any possibilities? Uh, several possibilities. Uh, uh, Austin P. here in Tennessee is one possibility, is actually an ex-Sarah uh, alum who's there, and they have a pretty strong group. Uh, even uh, the Citadel uh, has some people interested. Uh, uh, College of Charleston, uh, down that area. Uh, Central Florida uh, University has a sort of up-and-coming group. So there's actually quite a few options. So given what we have here, the costs aren't really unreasonable. Uh, we, you know, we'll have several people, I think, wanting to come in when they see the facilities that we have and the opportunities there. If you got another member or two, or would you have the reserves to either update one of the three sites? Or, uh, the only thing that we would look to update right now is... Uh, we could improve the seeing conditions if we go out here to Kitt Peak. We do need to uh, reconfigure the optics. And that's probably about a forty dollars or $50,000 job, but that would greatly improve the seeing, make it more uh, an image quality type telescope. At that same time, we could probably modify the thermal conditions a bit to make that better. Uh, at Cerro Tololo, we could think perhaps uh, maybe building a little addition or something. There's not really space inside, but building some like little uh, attachment here. Uh, under the wall that we could make thermally controlled. We worry about that in the terms that's such a small site, you don't want to like put heat in some place where you exhaust it, it's got to go somewhere, right? But there may be a way to like to, you saw how it slopes downhill, do some underground tubing and so forth, exhaust it downhill several feet so it kind of stays away from the building. Those kind of like construction projects, again, get up in you know, tens of thousands of dollars in a hurry and they don't go immediately to instrumentation or the science. But yeah, with new members coming in, we would probably do that because uh, since we just got the JKT, although we kind of grew quickly there, we're not really in a big hurry to jump on a fourth telescope somewhere. I was just wondering about you know, swapping one of the original telescopes out for a more modern... You know, like uh, that's no, because uh, we already know the price for that. If you want a one meter class telescope from scratch uh, right now, and not talking about the building, just the telescope, we've got the building, but just the telescope, you're looking at at least about 1.5 million. If you want a one meter class research grade telescope, uh, you might find something around for one million. But if you want it fully robotic, all these controls and so forth, the reason I say that is uh, Ace Peter Mackey built them. And his running cost to get one, basically he said, you know, it's a turnkey system. You know, you put in your order, uh, $1.5 million later, <laughs> you can go turn it on, start observing. <laughs> uh, but how long? That's the problem I have with Peter. How long? We asked Peter, how long? we've already learned with Peter, like I said, well, you know, we, you know, we love him, been friends with him, and worked with him since even before then. He started out at the old MDM observatory on Kitt Peak uh, way back in the 80s, really. Uh, but like I said, you know, uh, you run into problems, you run into shipments, you know, it's instrumentation, it's, it's been, you know, uh, even to get a CCD camera, we were frustrated because we were thinking, how long does it take to get a CCD camera? You know, and these are companies who are in this business. Well, but you've got to get the chip. You actually have to make that chip into the electronics. You have to test the electronics. It's taken us like 18 months from the time we actually ordered it to get delivery on just a CCD camera. Mm -hmm. right. 
Whereas you can go out to QSR or something, buy one off the shelf. Even that might be a $10,000 camera. Well, we're not off the shelf, but fairly quickly. If you want one at the specs that are required for our purposes right there that we want, uh, they build them from scratch, sort of, and they're just you know, 12, 18 months to get one. Seems right. So imagine if you ordered a $1.5 million telescope, you might see it three years from now. <laughs> right. well, certainly two years, uh, and then some shakedown time as well to go out. So it's just a, a slow process to get this done. That's the 1.5. I mean, if you're willing to just throw money at it, you know, like the federal government does sometimes, you just throw money at it, it may happen a lot quicker. It may not happen any better. It may happen quicker, but on our tight budget work with these things and constraints, making sure it's done right, uh, it does just take time and uh, money and expense. You just have to be patient. Uh, so it really took the most time was uh, the point, the original, or I'll say it was our original Sarah telescope, because literally it was in pieces on the floor of the four meter. And we had to, from scratch, pick a site, pick a contractor to develop the site, pick a contractor to build the dome, uh, pick another contractor to put the telescope back together and get it working. Uh, and that really did take four to five years to get all that back in place out there. And part of the reason was, you know, you just can't look in the phone book and find your typical observatory building contractor. They don't exist. Uh, in terms of telescope automation, at the time we were doing it, there were maybe, you know, three or four vendors perhaps in the whole world. And, you know, uh, and so, uh, and even those tend to be small vendors because how many people order one meter class telescopes? There's not a big order. That's why part of the reason uh, Peter has his troubles is that to stay in business, he has to work uh, around the world. And so he's worked on telescopes in Egypt, uh, in Korea, in Australia. Uh, he's also gone over to the Canary Islands. He's been in, he's you know, just, all over the world. Uh, he's spent a lot of time traveling. He's uh, done some work for a guy down in Texas. Uh, and so he could automate things and build things in place. But he really does work you know, all over the world. It's a global business. There's not enough uh, you know, interest in the United States itself to, to do such things of that nature. Uh, and so his is a unique business. He's pretty profitable at it, but it's profitable to a stint. It's like if it was really profitable, he would grow, right? He really can't grow because uh, you know, well, he makes money doing things. Uh, he does need almost to, to employ family to make it cost effective and has a small staff. He's got a software guy. He's got some machining guys. He still tends to do most of the designing himself and things of that nature. Uh, and basically his shop is there. You know, but big part of the land so he's got his house, his shop right next door to his house. Uh, and so it, uh, it works, but uh, it's a strong. It's an eclectic group of people, a small group of people worldwide. When you think of these major big observatory things, multi-million dollar, hundred million dollar projects, you know, those are for beyond our scope even and beyond his scope. So uh, we like to think that we're playing an important role. We're certainly doing world-class uh, research with what we do, but in terms of the bigger astronomy picture, we're still quite small. You know, while we're large in scope, uh, when the major community would look at our facilities, they would say, well, that's nice, but you know, you need to be getting 30 meter telescopes and looking at, uh, Know, cosmology purposes and so forth, and imaging inside these globular clusters and things like that. And we don't have the capability to do that. But the universe is so big, so many things to look at still that aren't unknown, that there's plenty that will keep us busy for a long time. And ultimately, I think, I don't know if I'll be, if it'll happen before I'm retired and gone, but ultimately I think they would like, there are some telescopes, some sites in Australia uh, that uh, would be an issue, perhaps even South Africa, if something came available. Well, those are the two real deep southern hemisphere sites to look at for other uh, hemispheres. Uh, South Africa is not quite the other hemisphere. Australia would really give us full 360 coverage if it went down there. Uh, and there actually is, we looked at a 24 inch in Western Australia, but it was just too remote, uh, too unsophisticated to try to think about refurbishing. Uh, 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 we need something that's year round. You don't, you don't get the summertime <laughs> down there. Uh, so we kind of keep our ear out if something happens to, to come available or that's reasonable and so forth, you know, ways to work around. Uh, but it keeps me busy enough just to kind of keep track of the night story. I am currently acting, by the way, as the uh, uh, site director for this facility here. So that's another can be time hog because somebody comes in and they forget how to run things or something breaks down. And I'm supposed to be the first person they call. Mm -hmm. Don't get too many phone calls in the middle of the night, but usually I'm checking emails and have Skype open or something and things will come up. Uh, and so most things we can handle. Fortunately, again, it has gotten robust if people will just read the manual <laughs> and get trained properly to know what they're supposed to do. 
Uh, and when things uh, do come up, then I can make the contacts to get things uh, fixed. And occasionally something does happen, you know, uh, mechanical failures do happen and things go down for a night. But, uh, we've also got them pretty much, I won't say absolutely, but pretty much faith in that they are fail safe to where unless something like a, a gear on a dome shutter breaks, which is quite unlikely, if we lose contact or the telescope realizes uh, there's nobody communicating with me telling things going on, uh, the dome controls are set to where it turns off motors and shuts the dome. Okay. Uh, and if it can, it'll even close the mirror of the telescope. So the idea is in the fail-safe mode, uh, it should be in a safe mode. So if weather comes up or something else, something seriously will get damaged. And we've had occasion to test that. It seems to work uh, okay. So it's one hope for all the observatories that are internally smart that way. Dan was asking about doing robotic. That is our for a dream picture as well. There's stuff out there to do it and ways to do it, but it's just not real simple and, and, and complex, and it's a time hog for somebody to make it happen. So while we can automate sort of in a night, I can set up routines and kind of have them run for a while to have it totally autonomous, where it just decides, oh, it's clear enough tonight, and this is what I'm going to look at, and it makes that decision on its own. Uh, that would be a pretty big piece of code because most of these robotic sites, which can be done, they're doing one specific task. They're doing a specific group of stars or a specific imaging program with the same routine, and it's fairly easy to do. We might one night be looking at asteroids with a spectrograph. The next night we might be deep sky imaging with an imaging camera. Uh, and so, you know, the priorities that have to be met and where things are in the sky, and <coughs> is it a partly cloudy night so you could do spectroscopy? Is it a photometric night you should do imaging? These are complex things just computers can figure out. But if you want to trust the computer to do all that, it might eventually do a more efficient job. But we haven't yet got to that point. And so uh, we're happy to still use it remotely. The other aspect is uh, it gives us a way to train, uh, train students, make sure we're involved somewhat. We're not just all of a sudden, oh, here's some, here's some numbers that came down. Here's some images. I'll take a look at these. One thing like, what do those images come from? Or was this, you know, I get suspicious myself, was the sky really that clear? You know, was it really on target, this sort of thing? So it's mostly reliable, but not 100%. And we just like to point out that even things like the Space Telescope and all, there's a whole crew of people controlling that thing. Yes, when it's actually running, it's doing it by itself, but somebody has to schedule it, somebody has to check it, somebody has to do all the calibrations and make sure all that's done. So we do that ourselves uh, with these facilities. And uh, you know, enough people involved to sort of share the load uh, so it's been a, a good 25 years so far, and with what the state pays me, probably another <laughs> 15, 20 years where I'll put that aside uh, uh, as well. So maybe I will see another uh, telescope. And, uh, and I say at one point that I observed uh, 24 hours with four different telescopes, uh, one object during the night or something. It's kind of a fun task to do. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to tell about here that Gary's been very good about uh, giving time on Sarah to my students. And uh, we've gotten several projects out of it. <coughs> and the, the students really like uh, doing that. And they know where the data is coming from. And it's not just you know something I did for them, which I used to do. You know, I, I used Sarah one night for my house. And well, that's fine. But now, since it's my students' projects, we go to ETSU, and they're the ones that stay up all night. <laughs> <laughs> controlling the telescope. I'm there, of course, but uh, they actually enjoyed that. And I've taken a few images for you as well. This right. time they couldn't yeah. do it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. So, so now we, I don't have to say, would you image this for me? Uh, so my students are getting where they can actually uh, do some of this themselves. And uh, it, it's very nice. And, and unlike some uh, commercial sites, we don't charge for that service. Yeah. We serve that part of it. The overall outreach that we're doing. Uh, thank you very much, Gary, yeah. for the time. Yeah, it's been uh, quite a good collaboration, I think. Um, Sarah did keep running automated. We lost the internet connection uh, when we were up there a month or so ago, but fortunately it finished what we had programmed into it. Yeah, it has, a, it waits like about 30 minutes, and yeah. basically what it more looks for is. Uh, uh, if the computers themselves have lost contact in some way. So there is a concern where if your connection locally goes down. Uh, but then what we can do is this. That's why I say the world concern is what if you lose connection out there? If my connection locally goes down, I've got 30 people I can call. 
Okay, maybe wake up in the morning, some cable and say, look, you know, we got this issue. Well, you log in because if it's, you know, my house wire or local Comcast, right, Comcast Observatory campus goes down. I haven't got options there. If it goes down at home, I'll just go into campus and log in. Or I can call, you know, certain several of the people and say, will you log in and shut it down for us in that sense. So the bigger concern is what if, you know, all of a sudden uh, uh, the power goes out at the observatory. We have a big UPS. It's something we have been checking it, and this battery's not dead. Uh, it senses and knows, oh, the power's out. I'm going to now, first thing I'm going to do is going to shut that dome. So it's, it's weather shut and so forth. So we have smart systems to do that. So that's fairly easy to take care of. So Because uh, we did have on that uh, dome, uh, which we don't have the image up there, but this is hydraulic now. But uh, even then, the lower part of this shutter, we still don't understand how. Because it was hydraulic and attached. But the lower part of that shutter, one must have been... Tornado force wind gust because that is set up where a wind gust can come straight up from underneath there. It ripped that lower shutter off and blew it about 100 feet down the mountain. And that's a heavy piece of aluminum out there. But fortunately, we did have our night people and, and they were probably, they climbed down, got some ropes and hauled it back up and drew it up onto the side up there so we didn't have this big gaping hole in the side. Uh, uh, and of course, there are lightning strikes on occasion. We do have lightning protection. Those don't seem to do any problems. So. So really in terms of that sort of dangerous weather, uh, Kitt Peak is the worst site. That's why we're debating should we keep fire insurance there or something on the outset. Uh, and really here, at, uh, not too much earthquakes down here. Uh, you get a bit heavier snows down here. I mean, Kitt Peak will get some snows, but I've seen like five, six feet of snow at Cerro Tololo, which means you can't get into access up there. As I said, Canary Islands, the only thing they were worried about there is uh, the dust from the Sahara. It tends to be higher dust, but they're higher up on the mountaintop. It can sort of filter out and drop down. So they don't open when the dust is so bad. They worry about it coating optical surfaces, and it uh, absorbs the light anyway. You wouldn't be observing for it. And those are all seasonal things. I think probably overall the weather statistics are best at Cerro Tololo because Kitt Peak's supposed to be about 70 percent. Canaries is supposed to be about 70 percent of the year. Uh, Cerro Tololo is more like 85 to 90 percent sometimes. Really nice uh, down there. Uh, and uh, I can say that the people are nicer in Chile and the Canary Islands if you go visit uh, out there than they tend to be in Arizona. Uh, that's what's my colleagues. I haven't been there yet, so that's on my, my future radars to actually visit these sites up close. Uh, students, of course, will say, yeah, take us. We're ready to go. We need a summer trip uh, out there. Uh, but uh, it's much easier for our budgets to, if they want to see a research site up close and personal, we can take them out to Kitt Peak for a lot cheaper. You know, it costs about twice as much to go to the other locations as it would to go to Kitt Peak for a few days, even though it's not such a, a great exotic remote site going out there. And if any of you were ever out there in Arizona, be sure and stop by. I think just because they sort of changed their visitors policy and so forth, we used to actually get visitors into the dome. I don't know if they're still doing that or not when our one ROA went away, but you certainly go up there and see the flamingo outside and see the dome firsthand. Uh, you can still look in the 4 meter and the 2.1 meter out there. So. If you're ever in the southwest, it's worth driving out there to, to be on the site for once yourself. And if you think ahead of time, they do have a night program. You can actually go up and use their 16-inch telescope. Usually we have to reserve that. There might be a small fee for that to help pay for the staff that's up there. But uh, people enjoy getting up there at night, saying, well, is that a real re you know, research national observatory facility at night? Looking through a telescope. Kind of cool thing to be able to do. You know, it's really nice up there. I've been there. Last time I was there, Two things really stood out in my mind. I can see M31 as an oval in the sky <laughs> with the like thumb, and I can see that the Milky Way was granular, <laughs> which you can't see either of those yeah. there. So even though there's a lot more light down low, straight overhead, it still looks really good out there. Everybody needs to go. It does help to go out in the wintertime. Part of the problem, I think it's so bad is I always go out with students in the summer, and it's really that hot, warm air is really bad out there. But midwinter is pretty good out there. Or we could go to Cerro Tololo. I haven't been actually there, but Cerro Mamayuca is on the other side, I think, of La Vicuña that Sonny was talking about. But you can see lots of great stuff there. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd love to go down there because you've got the, the center of the Milky Way is more visible. And, you know, that's the Atacama Desert, a little farther north, but that was just so high and dry, and it's just, when we, when we look at the all-sky camera at Kitt Peak, 
you can kind of, yeah, you can see the Milky Way out, things like that. When you look at the all-sky camera from several to lower region, it's just so much more contrast, just so much more comes out at you. It's just a, a much better sight. And so I haven't even looked at the Canary Islands, I understand that's uh, because it's so remote up on the, uh, you know, above the clouds in the sense that it's supposed to be a much darker sight. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, they've got more of the, uh, you know, ocean air in a sense, the winds coming off the Sahara and uh, northern Africa over there. Uh, I don't know about the actual sky brightness limit. I think, I think it's darker at Cerro than the Canaries. Uh, but I think the idea is for us is more the seeing conditions, and it's kind of similar there. But a lot of those seeing conditions are local, as you know, to your telescope, to your observatory. And the, both the, uh, well, Kitt Peak's dome is kind of nice. The wind conditions and the telescope mass aren't good. Cerro Tololo is better, but we got a stupid concrete building. <laughs> concrete blocks, even though they're painted white, they soak up the heat, and it's closer to the ground. It's not up higher. Uh, so the best site for seeing really should be there at the Canary Islands with the old JTT facility. Uh, and it was built, I think, I'm thinking about 1984, so it's also much newer. It was actually built early. They built it in England, shipped it to another site to test, and then shipped it again to La Palma for the final install as part of that group out there. And then they basically mothballed it for the same reason everybody else has. The economies, they can't run all these variety of telescopes. They put all their resources in the biggest ones. Uh, and as we mentioned there, while you know, they could have remotely operated it, you know, it would cost them about as much as us, half a million dollars to turn it remotely operation versus you know, paying staff $100,000 a year to operate it, maintain it, do the observation. So it's just not economically feasible for them to run these smaller sites anymore. Uh, and then Kitt Peak is in danger of just about privatizing everything. They're already offering, I know Clemson bought like uh, six months out. Clemson sort of owned the four meter for six months. And where they got the money for that is kind of expensive, but they had a project they wanted to do and they wanted big telescope time. And they said, sure, yeah, because you know, that was money in the bank for them. Uh, the 2.1 meter is up for you. Somebody wants a really big telescope. The old 2. It's another old telescope, but it's a good one. Plus the coup de spectrograph on it is sort of up for, for grabs. Uh, they've already turned over the 50 inch, which was on the admin building. The McMath is I think semi mothballed. So, and the wind, while it's functioning, it's a nice telescope. It's somewhat in trouble as well because it's only three and a half meters. So while it's newer design and better seeing conditions and so forth, uh, you know, everybody wants to push to these 30 meter monstrosities. You know, telescopes as big as the whole. <laughs> whole building structure here. Uh, that and the uh, interferometers, uh, the VLT systems with bigger things and all. So I don't know if anybody in the world is thinking of building a new big telescope that's uh, less than eight meters in size. It's a single well, dish. How much luck have they had with building optical interferometers? Hasn't that been rather a, a bit of a problem? No, it's been pretty well. Yeah. They're doing all the testing. I mean, the uh, scale size has been getting up, scaling in size. But no, they've got several tests on that. U.S. Naval Lab has been doing it. The VLT assembly there in Chile, I don't think it was quite as successful, but no, it's, it's about there to do it. I mean, the, the difference there is you're increasing resolution, you know, about losing the light gathering power, so it depends on what you want to do with it. Uh, you know, basic problem we have is you're still limited by seeing, but with adaptive optics and those changes taking place, uh, you know, that's why if you look, say, at a 30 meter on the ground with adaptive optics, if you put it in the right location, you're still fighting in Hawaii over that, but if you get it up there, uh, over the long history of it, uh, you know, the expense of it, it's still cheaper than putting, say, even, you know, a, a three meter up in space. It's taking us forever to get the James Webb Telescope up. Mm -hmm. And by the time it gets up, the large ground-based one will surpass its capabilities, probably, again. You know, it's still great. It'll be up there for 24-7 looking at things, and there's still those some atmospheric considerations. But if your goal is simply to look farther and farther and farther with more and more resolution, You'll be able to do that with bigger and bigger and bigger on the ground, eventually. Yeah, the bands that don't get through, but uh, so. You know, but even then, you can't design a space telescope that covers all wavelengths. So the James Webb will be more infrared based because they'll use the big ones on the ground. But even then, on the ground, you want to go to the near infrared. That does help the interferometry issues and the, the seeing issues as well to do that. So, so it's still growing. It's expensive. Uh, but there are people that will put money into it and uh, make it happen. Because there's people that put money into sending people to Mars on a 
when we mission, <laughs> tell them, why don't you build me a bigger telescope first so then we can look at those people while they're in your orbit saying, bye, because, you know, I've got six more months left to live or whatever it is up here. <laughs> uh, see what happens then. As much as I want to go into space, wouldn't mind maybe at some point going to Mars. I don't want, I want it to be a round trip. I don't want to go one way. I'm not that much willing to give up everything just for the aspect of going there. All right. Well, thanks again for everybody. Yeah.